team. We wanted to, to give you as much exercise and mental stimulation actually finding this space as we could. So, <laughs> it's so you also should be very you know, alert and stimulated and ready to, to really engage in the discussion about, about public health. Uh, our first presenter is Shoko Robin Nathan, um, and, and I will let her further introduce herself. But she's going to be giving her presentation on just current research in large a decade of partnerships. So please join me in welcoming her as our first presenter. Really 
um, have as a fundamental core to understanding what works in practice for whom and what is <coughs> And so all of that comes together for us in this participatory knowledge translation framework um, that Vish and I put together that, that really for us has been an organizing framework of what kind of inputs are needed in a community engaged partnership. Um, again, this idea of this ongoing iterative process that builds infrastructure in communities, sort of builds this engine for change when it comes to using research evidence to improve health and address health disparities. Uh, and so what I thought I'd do for you today, just in the interest of time, is really focus on this section in terms of the kinds of inputs and the kinds of investments that we found to be important. Um, certainly in the Q&A section, I think I'm happy to talk about the ways we evaluate these sort of formulas, make sure that we're actually getting the kinds of impacts that we need to warehouse sale that's happening today that I think we're going to be speaking for a <laughs> um, So we'll see how we do. Um, so the first one is this idea of institutionalized participation, really just the formality of agreements, right? Things that we all use, memorandum, understanding, and so forth. But what I wanted to highlight was our publication policy, that anything that comes out of a CBPR project for us, um, all the community partners and all the staff members are acknowledged directly in the manuscript as a minimum. Um, but ideally, where there's interest and time availability among our partners, that they're co-authors of the papers. And so these are just a couple of examples, I apologize for the quality of the image, uh, that Bill and I have co-authored over the last two years together. Um, and this to me is a really nice hallmark of not only just giving credit where it's due, but really the idea that we want to change what the research evidence base looks like. Right? If we're always talking about how it often is not usable or appropriate or relevant for our community partners, this is the way that we can also shape what our research evidence is there to draw upon. And so by getting our community partners to really provide that um, additional layer of analysis and interpretation um, you know, in terms of how community context and practice-based factors really impact ability to use evidence-based programs to adapt them. You know, so one of the things that we've always talked about is how do you take something that was developed in the Midwest to discover the white population and make it useful when it comes to obesity programming forms, right? And what do we need to do about practice? Do practitioners need to be able to do that in a way that holds true to the research evidence, but still also reflective of practice settings? And then another place where we focus a lot is this idea of human capital. So um, our partners raised the issue of, of being, getting these sort of funder pushes to use evidence-based programs more, but feeling that their organizations, particularly the community-based organizations, didn't have the staff capacity to find these programs, to adapt them, to use them. And so together we created a training workshop to build community capacity for finding and using these evidence-based programs, right? So that way we coincide and have to do that, have the capacity as a, as a small institution to do it. Um, we have 60 trainees from Lawrence, um, and we're actually revising this training workshop at this time, so we'll be reaching out to, to many of you, I'm sure, um, to see if you're interested in taking this if you're coming from a community-based organization. Um, but again, this idea of, you know, how do we do that in a way that reflects the constraints of practice and the realities of, of what practitioners need um, Another example of community capital comes from private impacts. So this was looking at um, capacity for strategic media engagement. So how might someone working at the CBO get their issue, you know, into the media? How might they ensure that the disparities angle, as Howard was saying, reflects a social determinant of health perspective rather than sort of a victim-blaming perspective? And, you know, what are the challenges around that? Um, and then as part of that, we had the opportunity to engage 16 students from Lawrence High School and Northern Ethics to do data collection for us. Um, so they learned about how you construct a survey, how you actually collect the data, how you analyze it, um, and a host of other professional development skills. They also got to come to Dana Farber and Harvard School of Health and meet researchers who uh, looked like them and who were encouraging them to change the, uh, the diversity profile that we have right now in terms of cancer prevention and control research. Um, yeah, but again, this is sort of these additional opportunities that weren't part of our grant, but came out through our partner process to say, if you're going to spend 70K on getting an external survey team to do this, why not keep those resources in Lawrence, and why not build the capacity in those at the same time? Uh, we talk a lot about social capital, so we know the public has to look at these partnerships in community settings. Um, and so our goal is always that how do we support the existing networks in communities? How do we build training sets so that they're offering networking opportunities, things like that? Um, and then we've done some social network analyses as well to sort of see did what we thought you know, was useful in terms of network development, did it have an impact? Um, so Bill and I actually really like this paper up um, to sort of say this is all, all Laura's data and some of you are actually the red dots in here. Um, but really to sort of say that even three years after a training program, people were still talking about the content and the people who were, more likely, or who were talking about it were the ones who were also more likely to be using evidence-based programs, right? So this idea of, of last 
the infrastructure for change, that's not just the intervention was run, never ran into heads. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, a really nice indication of the ways that we certainly not built those networks, but supported them. Um, and then in terms of resource sharing, this has been an important thing. We did a back of the envelope calculation that over the last 10 ish years, we've um, directed $300,000 worth of resources um, in direct funds. So through stipends and travel support, we have a community um, program coordinator, Carmenza, who's here somewhere, um, who's a face of our, our program, certainly in Lawrence. Um, and so a, a lot of her time has been on project work, certainly, but also to serve the needs of the Maris Health Task Force. So that's been a really nice way to in fine contribution. We've had about $30,000 in lead grants go out through our training programs. Again, as I mentioned, hiring local staff and students. Um, and then, of course, investigator and staff time. So Sarah Minsky sits on the research initiative working group. Um, again, just to have that ongoing presence and, and ensure that whatever grants we're putting forth or work we're doing really reflects the needs and, and requirements of our Lawrence partners. <coughs> Um, and then our final piece in terms of, of inputs is this idea of knowledge co-production and exchange. So again, you know, we often have these very theoretical questions that we're asking in our research studies, um, but we really try to create these things like two-page briefs that are very much oriented towards practitioners. So for example, we did a social network analysis. We basically said, you know, here's what we did, here's what we found. But to me, this is the important part. How does social network analysis help your work as a practitioner? Like, why should you care? Um, and this actually resulted in a, a day-long workshop for community practitioners on very applied, you know, network ideas and network analysis concepts. But again, with this idea, how can we leverage this kind of knowledge but make it very much practice focused? So we're wrapping all of these kinds of ideas of investments and infrastructure together in um, a new partnership again between Cancer Center and UMass Boston. Um, I'm the co-director of the Outreach Board along with two investigators from UMass Boston and Phil Messitz on our community advisory board. Um, so we're trying to bring engagement, outreach, and implementation science all together. Uh, we're working with community and faith-based organizations, so that's an expansion for us to, to be moving through the supporting churches and, and other types of faith institutions. Again, with capacity building, student training to, di to diversify the, the cancer control pipeline, um, and then really supporting outreach and dissemination to make sure that again, everything we're doing as a partnership starts our community partners. So I'll just close with this. Um, you know, for us, the real motivation here is that we have this rich research evidence base. It's often imperfect, and we want to improve the quality and the utility of this evidence base. Um, we all have this common goal of addressing health outcomes and health disparities. I feel like we offer it in our place where we're trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Right? We're just producing research that just has nowhere to go because there is no receptive home. And my argument is that through participatory research, we build this community infrastructure for change, and we have a path forward. Right? We're in public health. We have no money. So it's going to be a small path. But there's a path, and to me that's the energizing piece um, and, it, and a real sort of mark of why do you do this in a way. So I'll, I'll leave it to the one now. Today has been a journey back to my life. <laughs> Seriously. Um, in CBPR, community-based participatory research, but also the work that um, I've had the blessing to do in my city where I've lived for 25 years, and where I really have spent a lot of time. And so, um, it sounds really neat, right? All this work sounds really neat, very organized, but it wasn't always that way. And so, I'm going to show you... So, I'm going to show you, basically, through the uh, lens of the Mayor's Health Task Force, how we've done some of this work with community-based participatory research in our city, what has been our role, and who we are. No time, I think. <laughs> At no time, we'll do a uh, presentation really around what is the mayor's health task force. So I'm going to highlight one of our projects which we're very, uh, that we're very proud of, which is the Lawrence Youth Council. But just so you know, just quickly, the net, uh, mission, we just, we're, there's a brand mission. Uh, we've just underwent a strategic planning process. And we're a multi-sector coalition that promotes health equity for all reading through advocacy, education, capacity building, and networking. So this is the way we do things. We're a coalition, we're not programmatic. And the programs that we do support are usually done through a consultant. But this is our vision. We hope to see a healthy, safe, and thriving community for all. And I want to highlight for all because uh, Dr. Howard Cook was talking about the diversity that we're going to see. We're already seeing what we're going to see by 2040. So I think that we, need, we have plenty of time to get ready for what's to come. And, I'm very proud of our city. 
Florence is an amazing city with very rich history, amazing people, and unfortunately sometimes we're showcased, you know, in the media as this very negative city where there's a lot of crime, all these negative things. But I think we need to take time to really celebrate the diversity, that the fact that we're we're in you know innovators, the fact that we're an immigrant city, that we're vibrant, that we're proud, we have a sense of community. This is where we live, this is where we work. I mean, if you ever have gone by the common park in the summertime and see people playing dominoes and children playing and people walking around the park because we were able to put markers around the park. I mean, these are the things that make me really happy. We have an amazing group of people who are committed. But as in any city like Lawrence, we have a lot of challenges, right? <coughs> Which this challenge is sometimes make us ideal for research. And so for years, we'll have researchers come in, we have no knowledge that they were here, they'll uh, investigate, ask questions, and we have another uh, vid, um, slide that I can put up for the factor of time that usually is like the hole in the wall that everybody, you know, perks sort of circles it, puts tape, everybody looks at it, everybody measures it. People go by it, they see it on the ground, and then a whole, people, a whole bunch of people, you know, construction people are there looking. And then all of a sudden one day you go by and the hole is still there, the tape is still around, and nothing has been done, nothing has been communicated to the community. Nobody knows about the research. I mean, there was a research that was being done that we were able to stop, which was swapping people's saliva, and they were targeting people in, in housing development projects. $25, you do this, you take your saliva. I mean, what kind of thing was this? And we were able to sort of rally up and say, no, that's not going to happen. They need to stop. That's not going to happen in here. Or we're exhausted, where they research and research and research the same thing, and we never end up with any of the data. People feel used and abused, and Nothing happens, so the helicopter effect, they drop, they take the information and they leave and then we have nothing left to show. And so, something happened in 2006. And I was happy and I blessed and I see some people that are here, Martha was part of that, but came together and said, okay, we're gonna put together enough of that. We're gonna put together this group, it's gonna be called Research Initiatives Working Group. I'm gonna look at how researchers are coming to our city, how they're gonna do research, how is it going to be done? What's going to be the value? How are we going to share that information? I mean, all that Shoba talked about really has been a result of the years. I mean, we've had a, a partnership with uh, Dana Farber and Harvard for 10 years. But it was really has been based on this. Core principles are basically research is helpful to community development. And as a new, brand new community development director, I get to bring that sort of perspective, that sort of lens, social justice, health equity sort of lens to my job and my role now as I look into housing and other areas. And so, it's important. The data that we collect, how many of you, are, how, for, for how many of you, it's easy for you to collect local data? Who has time as a program director or executive director, whoever? Nobody has really a lot of time or resources to devote to that, so that's one of the things that working with a, a academia um, provides us with. Working with community members makes better science. We are the gatekeepers. Guess what happens? We are the faces. And so we're very protective of our city. If you're going to be in our city, you need to make sure that you have a good plan. You need to make sure that you understand the guiding principles. You understand that dissemination is going to be shared. We get to choose how that information is going to be delivered to the community because we already have enough negativity going on. We don't need to add to the pot. And so that's the kind of thing that we're able to do. And we're the gatekeepers. Academia, many times, we have been blessed that we have established long-term partnerships. But academia, many times in the past, will come in and leave. And they say, you know, you are the one who brought us to our door. You told them to do surveys on our people, in our program. What happened? And so that's one of the things that that's sort of a, um, we have certain controls. And then that members of the community should create good partnerships based on fairness and positive exchanges. And Shoba talked about that. And for that, we got a list of questions. And by the way, I have a, pack, a few packets here if you're interested in the, in the uh, guiding documents. Um, there's a, a, a question for research partnership agreements. And I know that we have sat down with UMass Lowell on many occasions to go over those questions. Every single time there's a brand new project coming in. Um, there's two sets of questions. One for CVPR, meaning community-based participatory research, and one for research. If you're still going to do research on your own and it's not involved in the community, there's still expectations for you. And then finally, it goes to your research terms so that everybody speaks the same language. This is just really seriously a handful of some of the projects that I could go back and remember what, that we've been involved in. But I'm sure that I'm missing a couple here. And all that data, we have information. 
and it has helped inform our programs. It has helped us look for uh, find gaps in, in service delivery. It has helped, helped us to look at policy, how we deliver policy, how we create policy, how we promote it. And some of the things that we have benefited from, Shoba alluded to, which is training. One of the things that I was really proud of is that um, I was a, a community uh, principal investigator for our mammography uh, qualitative research project, which is by far one of the most successful projects we've done that have changed the way local hospitals and, and our medical centers do business, and how we have bridged the uh, mammography uh, services to women. And so, um, social network analysis, we talked about co author I mean, I've, I never thought that I'd be something that I would enjoy. It's a lot of work, and I'm really happy that you guys take on the, the you know, the uh, leadership in this, but it's really interesting and it's really fun, and it's good to see your city, not your name, but your city's name, on all this paperwork at a national, in a, on a national level. Uh, we have done a lot of media workshops, which from this media workshop, we developed the strongest networks with our uh, journalists. Uh, that we have to this day uh, able to call, pick up a phone, send a text, and we're able to get coverage and support. Employment opportunity for those things you talked about, but also TA. So we have done, they have done free workshops on program evaluation, logic models, I mean anything you can think of. If we have a marketing effort, they've been able to review our information, our flyers, our brochures, that's something that sometimes you don't have that uh, capacity within uh, your organization. And uh, one of the things that happened with the mammography uh, screening days and all that work is that we're able to do a call to action with the state stop the uh, Women's Health Network, which was a free service to people, to women who are uninsured, underinsured to get their breast cancer, cervical cancer, and cardiovascular screenings. We're able to bring everybody together under the same roof to say, okay, what are we going to do? Because if you're going to stop that work, what is going to happen to the women that we serve? And out of that has come a lot of things. Um, just to go over some sort of challenges in some time, there's some lessons learned, and we still learn in two minutes. We'll be done, this is the last one. <laughs> uh, academia and community have different cultures, so it's not as easy as we put it. Uh, we have learned from one another, we continue to be open, open-minded, be transparent, be frank with one another. That thing that's important for people to do, and I want to say that there was one researcher in my class that um, they came to us, and you know, very high level people, we have our first meeting, and they pull out their little graph, you know, the little um, organizational. organizational chart. And Martha and I are sitting there, and we see at the very bottom of the chart the two community health workers. And we just basically said, no. You see these two little people down here? Without that, you have no research. So that's not, I don't like the way, we don't like the way this flows. So are we going to have a true partnership here? We gotta change the way it is, and they had to change the way that that graph was created. It was actually done in circles, which was really nice. Trust building. Don't come in with your plan. It has to be a relationship. We have to spend time together. We need to know who you are. To us, trust building. That trust building is the key to everything else. Uh, don't ask who are your key stakeholders in your community. Who can we contact? Who are your leaders? Don't just go in there assuming this is for researchers and vice versa. Find out who's leading the, the way. Uh, listen and value and respect knowledge of community. This is one of the most important things. Communities have their own pulse. You need to learn that. In order to learn that, you gotta go back to trust building. Open and ongoing communications. Both partners are equal, so it's the community advisory boards. You need to have flexibility. Well, our grant is due, we have six months of a, mm, the community doesn't work on that schedule. And so let's talk about it, come up with a plan that's going to be beneficial to both of us and make sure that we respect the communities. And then you see the rest there. So I think that has been very beneficial to us to have all this partnership and this um, relationship and it has allowed us to go nationally to go present and put Lawrence on the platform for doing amazing CVPR process. So for that, I'm going to close and I know there's going to be questions, so thank you. Thank you very much, Shola and Doma. I want to publicly apologize to Doma for neglecting to introduce her as a part of the presentation in the beginning. I'm, 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 I'm probably sort of probably sort of probably as well. But, um, absolutely, just wonderful work that you guys are doing this year. It, it, it's just great. Our next presenters are Dr. Julia C. and uh, Keith Knott, and they're going to uh, to get your, your, your slide stories, and let's give a couple minutes to do that. Um, and look we'll forward to hearing them.
worth it, I'll say, but I apologize for occasionally all the noise in the background. The speakers are doing wonderful jobs talking over it and not letting it distract me. So thanks, Shoban and Vilma, for laying a really good groundwork for our talk. Um, so my name is Joyce. So I'm a family medicine resident doctor at Mary Lawrence Family Health Center. And I'm here taking notes. Um, I'm also a family medicine uh, doctor at the clinic. Um, and we are also from the Lawrence Family Medicine Residency. Uh, we are going to talk today on how our clinic has made steps towards uh, addressing social children's health through a community partnership specifically focused on community security. All right, so I just to give a little bit of background kind of where this project came from. This is the health center. Most people know the health center if you spent any time in Lawrence at all, which I assume most people can do. Um, and uh, so this is our main site, 34 Havel Street, and it's the site where our residency program is based. Um, and I'm going to talk actually a little bit more later in a subsequent talk about uh, the history of the health center um, and uh, the history of the health center movement. Um, you know, but. The, the, the mission of the health center is to think about health um, on the grand scale, right? So, I mean, our mission is to improve the health of residents of the Merrimack Valley and Lawrence specifically, um, as well as to train residents to go on and continue to do that work, whether it's here in Lawrence or whether it's in other communities. Um, uh, and that's really the mission of what we do. Um, and so it was built out of, actually, the health center came out of a community partnership. Um, now, close to 40 years ago, um, and has you know, just grown and grown and grown and grown. And I think that one of the things about sort of a little, what started off as this little community partnership that sort of felt, I think, really close to the community, as it's grown, it's a little bit tougher sometimes within the context of what has become this big, you know, uh, organization, a big, in a sense, a corporation of sorts, right? To sort of feel quite as connected in that same way. Um, and, you know, we as physicians within the Community Health Center and within Lawrence recognize the social determinants of health, which Dr. Coe gave a nice little background about and has already come up here, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but the social determinants of health are really a key issue in terms of the care of our patients. And we recognize that those, uh, that those social determinants, you know, are, are behind many of the issues that our patients are confronting on a day-by-day -day basis and impacting um, their health outcomes. Right. So when I'm seeing a patient who's got poorly controlled diabetes, well, there's a whole host of things that could be entering into that. You know, they may not have a kitchen that they have access to. They may not have money to get their medication. They may not have. Um, uh, they may not have uh, transportation to get to their uh, doctor's visits, and those are things that are all going to potentially impact their care. And sometimes those things are things that come up during the visit, and we actually know that about our patients. But sometimes they don't. You know, the imperatives of our day-by-day -day care, you know, mean that we're often moving really fast, and sometimes it comes up when somebody's got that poorly controlled diabetes, and we say, let's really try and dig into this and figure it out. Sometimes we're doing a really good job about being upfront about it, but we've traditionally, medicine has left it up to us as individual physicians to get this information from patients and sort of find out um, on a case-by-case -case basis what's going on. Um, and we, as doctors within the community, want to think about, well, what is the big picture? Right? So we started a group, uh, we call it the Social Determinants of Health Committee at the Health Center a number of years ago, um, and it made sort of fits and starts in terms of progress. But the idea of that, and sort of one of our big goals, oops, I didn't get that next piece to come up. So there's supposed to be a thing that comes up on here, but it didn't. But that's okay. Um, the, the idea behind uh, what we've been thinking about was um, the idea of social needs screening which is something that is growing as a concept throughout um, the medical community at this point. Um, and what I had here was actually an in-press paper that's coming out in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine by Laura Gottlieb, who's one of our family medicine colleagues out at UCSF, who's been kind of a major leader in terms of thinking about this. But that idea of being really proactive about screening for social determinants of health as people come into the visit, just in the way we might screen for, you know, do you smoke? Um, you know, asking people right up front, um, what are the things that are going on in your life that are barriers to your being able to get the care that you need and have the health outcomes that we want for you um, and that you want for yourself? So um, that's kind of the idea of what we've been talking about, and that's a really big thing to think about, sort of what are all the different things that we might actually screen for. Um, and one of the members of our committee, Liz Quinn, who unfortunately is no longer with us in Lawrence, 
but she had a craft fellowship um, to do some additional work, and she decided for her craft fellowship to bite off a piece of that social needs screening concept and focus really on food insecurity. Um, and screening patients for food insecurity at regular office visits, not waiting until it came up as a problem, um, and then thinking about what interventions could be put into place for that. And so that's what we did as our first step, and Julia's going to take it forward to talk a little bit more about what we actually did um, and what we've learned from it. So we started asking our patients um, about the hunger vital side screening. So this, this is a validated two-question screen that helps identify people who have food insecurity. Food insecurity is um, basically a state of, of not having enough food or, or worrying about not having enough food. Um, and so these are two questions that were asked uh, at clinic visits, and if anyone answered yes or a positive response to either one, then we identified them as and we asked over 1,800 patients, and, uh, and we found that 70% of them answered, uh, gave a positive response. So about 70% of the patients were asked for identified food insecurity. Um, so in conjunction with this, we realized that we needed to provide more resources to our patients. And we started um, looking for partners in the community um, and we reached out to two major partners, Project Bread and the Greater Boston Food Bank. And we worked with them to develop programs that would help um, alleviate this problem. Um, and we'll talk about the work that Project Bread and, um, and Greater Boston Food Bank has done for us. Um, in conjunction with all that, we developed, uh, we started doing interviews and focus groups with our patients and to find out more about their experiences with food. So the first step was to um, to assess what are, are the assets in the community and um, to identify what does this community already have and, uh, in terms of um, helping this issue of food insecurity. So some of the things that are already happening in the community were CSA farmer markets, uh, food pantries, um, and um, so we searched search for all the uh, resources in the community and one of our team members and developed a handout that we started giving out to our patients who identify as food insecure. <coughs> Another, so going back to our partnership with Greater Boston Food Bank, um, we um, they helped bring a mobile market to our clinic and so now uh, once a month um, families or households are bringing home 20 pounds of fruits and vegetables. Um, and so far in the span of less than a year, um, the Project Bread um, partnership has, has allowed us to help more than 50, 52 um, patients um, submit new applications for supplemental nutrition, uh, the SNAP program, and also in less than a year, the global market has distributed more than 100,000 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables to over 1,000 households. And um, there's, there's more updated numbers, so this is probably a lot of um, So now that we have um, some of these interventions going on, we want to understand more about what our patients um, or community members were experiencing about uh, food insecurity, um, what they identify as their challenges, and um, how, how do they describe what they're experiencing. So this is how we were doing it through uh, focus groups. And in our focus groups, we, we did a, we have we done a, um, a few focus groups and we found some major broad themes, so such as economic challenges, impact on health and mental, physical and mental health, um, challenges such as transportation, and also how the, there are community inputs in the So I just want to um, point out a few interesting quotes that we've done from our focus groups. So in terms of economic um, limitations and budgeting, some, someone said, if you have money for food, but you need to pay for electricity, 
it is better to pay for that than to eat. And another one showing impact on health. Sometimes illness can get aggravated because you're not eating as you should. For example, you're supposed to eat three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But if you just have lunch, if you are sick, that will set you back because you're not eating as you should. So it's really interesting there um, how patients were describing their, um, the impact of not having um, So we, this was a start. So we need to keep um, understanding what is you know, going on with our patients. And um, we hope to continue to do those things and, and talk more at uh, our patients and find out more about their experience. What, did, what else do they do? We would love to hear more about how they experience, uh, what their experiences are with other assistance programs. And also, it is interesting when we hear about what their experiences are here versus within their own country. Um, so we hope to do more in terms of um, And other future steps for these community partnerships is that we as we're assessing more of the impact on our patients, um, we would like to, to reach out to more community um, partners so that we can further um, do more, um, add more to the intervention, such as um, boosting uh, access to the SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Program, um, having budgeting seminars to improve the shopping experience, um, cooking classes to help more uh, with cooking up, uh, meals that are on a budget. Um, so these are some ideas that we can um, to do with, to build on the social perspective. Um, in our experience, we um, we learned some major lessons that we will continue to seek feedback from our community and our patients um, in these interviews and groups. And we will continue to identify and <coughs> leverage the assets to build a cohesive plan. So um, we'll be open to building a collective vision with all of our team stakeholders to include more partners in the community. And most importantly, we also learned that it's important to define um, what are our metrics to you know, assess the impact of these <coughs> from the first global market um, back in August 2017. Let's August 2016. Thank you, Julie and Pete. Well, it's, it's wonderful that, that not just that, 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 that you're able to recognize the, the importance of, you know, towards a holistic patient and, and, and treating the holistic patient, but also recognizing that and not waiting for someone else to do it. You're actually taking the initiative to do those things yourself. I think this is a great example of, of how communities can, can, can partner and, um, and, and make community members' lives better. Our third set of panelists are uh, by Dr. Michael Sandberg and Martha Velez, and I will uh, let them further introduce themselves with you. Thank you. is focused on Lawrence Hispanics. Uh, its application is to all Lawrence residents. It's a two-part talk of the uh, I'll try to move right along. Uh, Point that to the uh, first I want to speak about rehabilitating low vision due to uncorrected refractive error in Lawrence. It's uh, I'm proposing a collaboration between the Massachusetts Lions I care professionals, business, media, and government to provide eyeglasses to residents who need them. Now, what is uncorrected refractive error? There are two major types. There's uh, hyperopia and myopia. Hyperopia is often called far-sighted. It sounds good, but it really isn't so good. Uh, in hyperopia, uh, a target at distance is focused behind the retina. And to correct that, we put a positive or convex lens in a pair of glasses to cause the focus to move up 
onto the rest of itself. Uh, in children, uh, children can exert a combination to change the curvature of the lens as if they had a positive lens in front of the eye and are able to bring that target in focus. But when we become adults, uh, we lose that ability to accommodate. And the only way to, for a hyperopic patient to focus on the retina is through an optical aid like glasses. In myopia or nearsighted, nearsightedness, the targets of distance are focused in front of the retina. And there's no solution to that uh, except to put a concave lens in front of the eyes in a pair of glasses to bring that focus further away onto the retina itself. These are the two major forms of uh, refractive <coughs> Now, what are the consequences of low vision? Low vision is usually defined as the visual acuity less than 2040. What does 2040 mean? It means that, at, uh, that a person with low vision can see letters at 20 feet that a normal person can see at 40 feet. Think of it as basically a 50% impairment. Children with low vision are at increased risk of underachieving in school and incurring pedestrian injuries. Adults with low vision are more likely to restrict or forego driving. Seniors with low vision have increased susceptibility to falls, are more likely to experience depression, show increased use of social services, are less able to go out alone, and have higher mortality. Uh, the, uh, there's a national study that goes on periodically that is a survey that assesses a vision and other capabilities across the country. It's called the NET, it's called NAME, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And in, in the years 1999 to 2002, it found a, a prevalence of, for persons with impaired distance vision due to uncorrected refractive error of 4.7% for non-Hispanic whites, 8.9% for non-Hispanic blacks, and 9.9% for Hispanics. Screenings performed in Lawrence by the District 33 and Lions Automobile have suggested that about 20% of Hispanics have low vision due to uncorrected refractive error. They get twice the national estimate for Hispanics. Uh, the difference in the estimate is probably due to most of the Hispanics in the national estimate are Mexican Americans from the uh, Southwest. So, uh, how can we. Uh, uh, I'm proposing a program to provide eyeglasses to lower residents with low vision due to uncorrected refractive error. It has several steps. The first is to ascertain the target population through school testing of children and advertising for adults. To measure, second, to measure distance visual acuity with their visual correction to identify low vision <coughs> that is acuity less than 2040. Three, to attempt to correct persons with low vision to 2020 through the use of uh, eyeglasses. Four, if corrected visual acuities are 2020 or 2025, to send an eyeglasses prescription to a consulting optometrist for authorization, and then to purchase these low-cost distant eyeglasses online, and confirm that the client has corrected visual acuities of at least 2025 with the new eyeglasses. If the corrected visual acuity in either eye is less than 2040, to obtain and send retinal photographs to consulting ophthalmologists for interpretation and recommendation. Now, I'm just going to illustrate a few things about this. Uh, how would we ascertain adults who are the target population? We could have sample questions that appear in businesses, on the media, or say in public places. Some examples would be, would you say your eyesight <coughs> profiles is poor or very poor? Do you have moderate or extreme difficulty reading street signs or the names of stores? Do you have moderate or extreme difficulty driving in bad weather or at night? Do you drive less because of your eyesight? Do you have moderate or extreme difficulty enjoying TV because of your eyesight? 
The part, once we have ascertained the clients, children and adults, <coughs> the next step will be to evaluate them. The possible test site in time should be testing could be performed in the main branch of the Lawrence Public Library on selected evenings. The main branch is in a central location in Lawrence, surrounded by a high density of Hispanic households, can be reached by public transportation, is handicapped, accessible, and has free parking. How do we go about determining the optical correction for these persons with low vision with uncorrected refractive error? Uh, what we would use is an instrument that's called an auto refractor, which is pictured on the left, which automatically places the best optical correction in front of the eye, and then allows the examiner to measure corrected distance visual acuities with an internal letter chart, which is illustrated on the right. And this would provide the, uh, what the, the prescription for the uh, optical correction. Once we get the optical correction authorized by an optometrist for those persons whom we were able to get their vision to 2025 or to 2020, uh, we would then go online to order quality prescription eyeglasses, which can actually be obtained at a very low cost. This is an example of one site that I personally use, and I know others have used for them their eyeglasses. You can get uh, quality eyeglasses with your choice of frames, distance eyeglasses for as little as seven dollars. About five percent of what you normally pay if you go to an optician. For those individuals who we cannot correct to 2020 or 25, they may have a form of ocular pathology that uh, prevents the acuity from returning to normal. These individuals would be evaluated with retinal photography to detect eye disease. Uh, this particular retinal camera does not involve using no eye drops. It involves infrared viewing with the retinal at low level flash. And it provides high resolution digital images archived to CD for both side evaluation by consulting ophthalmologists. And that, that ophthalmologist would make an interpretation based on the appearance of the retina, and I'll show you some examples a little later. Uh, so uh, to try to uh, treat, appropriately treat the uh, client. So this program would be a collaboration that would need schools to refer children with low vision, media and government to advertise for high-risk adults, the Lawrence Public Library for testing, the District 33 and my automobile to lend equipment, technicians to perform screenings, eye care professionals to authorize eyeglasses or follow-up, and businesses, and possibly a grant, to pay costs. It run efficiently this program to help up to a thousand Lawrence residents each year. Now I'm going to go on to the second part of the talk, uh, dealing with the prevalence of glaucoma among Lawrence Hispanics. Glaucoma is a group of diseases that damage the eye's optic nerve and result in vision loss it is detected by characteristic changes to the optic disc in retinal photographs and is associated with an elevated eye pressure in about 50% of cases. Vision loss begins in the periphery, resulting in many asymptomatic individuals until disease has advanced, has advanced to involve the same. Now, this is going to be tough for you to see in these lights, but uh, this is a retinal photograph of a normal, <coughs> a normal individual. I'm just going to point here, this is the optic disc, these are blood vessels, and perhaps you can make out this small area here that's pale or whitish, that's called the cup, C-U-P. It's an area that's concave uh, when you look into the eye. A patient with, a person with glaucoma, on the other hand, has basically a normal appearing retina, but perhaps you can see that the dimensions of the cup are much larger than what you see in the normal Here's a case of advanced glaucoma where the cup has assumed a very large size. Uh, enlargement of the cup, cup represents a degeneration and loss of optic nerve fibers, which is the uh, characteristic outcome in that glaucoma. Uh, the prevalence of glaucoma is usually reported to be comparable in non-Hispanic whites and Mexican Americans, at a level of about 2% of the population. 
However, Hispanics living in Las Vegas <coughs> have more than three times the glaucoma prevalence of Mexican Americans, about 7%. So what about Lawrence Hispanics who tend to share a racial heritage with Barbados Hispanics? The District 30 Command Lines Island Bill has offered blood pressure, vision, and hearing screening for the Hispanic population of Lawrence as part of Salud Latina. The Lawrence Latin Lives Club and the Lawrence Senior Center have provided bilingual interpreters. Of the 72 Hispanics who underwent retinal photography in 2000 and 2001, eight, or 11%, had a large cupping or other optic distal abnormalities consistent with glaucoma. This percentage suggests that glaucoma prevalence is at least as high as that seen in the Barbados Eye Study. Moreover, none of the glaucoma suspects in Lawrence reported having been previously diagnosed with glaucoma. So we're predicting in Lawrence a particularly high prevalence of glaucoma. To manage Hispanic clients, clients found to have or be suspect for glaucoma or other sight threatening treatable ocular disease. The District 33 and Lions Island Bill has established a long-standing collaboration with Martha Bellas, Executive Director, Executive Director of the Lawrence Senior Center. It has been our practice to provide Martha with the digitized retinal images and other results to enable her to follow up these adverse clients. And now I'll turn the podium over to Martha to serve her up for Hi, everyone. So my name is Martha Bellas. I don't have uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> I actually don't like PowerPoints. I'm going to tell you why. Because as I sat here and I watched everybody speak, I can tell you that I feel that the Senior Center is the gateway to the city of Lawrence. For every research that has been spoken about, the Senior Center has been part of that research. If not, I am the one that sits there and I am the gateway to the public, to the pulse of the community. I am the one that speaks, screams, and yells about how we treat our, our city, how we treat our, our residents, and how especially we treat our elders and what needs and wants are there for the elders. So um, as far as this is concerned, right, with um, eyes and research, it was really because I am part of what was used, the first research that I was involved with was REACH with Greater Lawrence Family Health Center and Dean Claycorn. And what we were really looking at was diabetes and when Dean approached me, I was already running a pilot program in the, C in the senior center, not knowing what research was really. Um, when Comenza needs someone, she comes to the senior center and knocks on my door and says, Mother, I need help finding people. Or, Mother, I need to do research. How do I do it? And when Vilma needs something, she comes and she talks to me and we get through the community. And we've done a lot of partnerships together. I was actually the first person in the city of Lawrence that partnership with doctors and um, elder services and Lawrence General to do prostate screening for um, Latino men in the city of Lawrence. So I've been long term doing this, not knowing that it was research, but doing research until the researchers came in and we formed partnerships. But this was really uh, a part of what we do for Fierta Salud and really looking at what affects people when they have diabetes and how glaucoma can be part of it. Um, what Mike is talking about here um, is making sure that I want to make sure that when people get screened, there's always follow-up to the screening because it's very easy to be screened, right? And it's very easy to tell people, come on in, we're doing something for free, and everybody comes, right? But what happens is after that screening is done, right, it's the important part that what the City of Lawrence and the Senior Center and an amazing group of staff that I have that really have a commitment to making sure that people stay healthy, right? And as we do research and we want to make sure that the research is part of what we know, now how do we put it into effect? And um, to my sister sitting over there, uh, I'm the one that screams about programs because everybody wants to sit, change policy and systematic changes, but we can't change policy and we can't make systematic changes if we don't know what people really need and want. So glaucoma is part of diabetes, right? So how was I going to make sure that the diabetic that was being screened at the Fair de Salud, which is an interactive health fair, it is not about papers because people put papers, as I do when I go to conferences, into a bag and then throw it in my trunk and I say goodbye and I don't look at it until I have a problem or I have a need for it. But if we do interactive things, people learn, they gather information, and then they want, they really make partnerships with you, right? Because they get to know you, you know, 
when he's sitting there, she's a doctor, and they're asking doctors, they're going to know the face. This is the doctor. When she comes into the senior center, oh, the doctor, there's the doctor, right? <laughs> and they go talk to the doctor. So my whole thing was, when you do this, what do you do with it? So when he provided all this information to me, which I am not a medical person, I have no idea, I would just say, okay, Mike, tell me who I have to reach out to and why do I have to reach out? Make it simple so I can understand it, so then I can explain it and then connect. So what's my job? The connect part, right? It's how do I get the person to be screened? I mean, he made it very clear, right? There was eight people, right? That showed signs of glaucoma. That's diabetic, right? That's, that's what happens when you're diabetic. Something's wrong, so we need to do it. So then I would then reach out to the community, and I'm not gonna say who it is because we can't put that out, but I do have partners that I send people to, and they really do take it upon themselves and screen them um, and check to see if we need glasses, we try to help them. But we take it that next step. We make sure, if men got screened for prostate, we make sure that they got connected to a doctor. If women got screened for whether it's, you know, breast cancer, we worked really close on breast cancer. Vilma and I were like tag team with cancer when we came to prostate and, uh, and uh, breast cancer. So for me, I'm the one that sits in the room, and I've done a lot of research. Um, I've done a lot of research with UMass Lowell, with UMass Worcester, with the REACH grant, and we actually, I mean, we can actually say that I've probably, like, partnered many times over with Great Lawrence Family Health Center, and we made a difference in diabetes education. We made a, 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 a tremendous impact on how people take care of themselves, just this week, um, one of the elders that I actually started the diabetes research for um, passed. But when I met her, she was only 62 years old, 28 years ago when I started um, at the senior center. And she was diabetic. I, I had no clue what diabetes was. There's no diabetes in my family. I had no clue. Of course, today I'm very educated and I know, but I started to see behavior that I was like, this cannot be healthy. And um, I started talking to doctors and nurses and nutritionists and um, Jean Lucier, who um, actually used to work for the Marymount Valley Nutritional Program and then went on to work for Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, was a phenomenal asset into really breaking down foods and educating people. And again, all of this came from what? Grassroots, seeing a person, knowing what their needs are, watching behavior of a lot of people, and then saying, how do we change that? Because it's very easy for us to sit somewhere and write a paper, or write a book, or write research, and say, this is what we want to do. But reality, it's not going to affect people. So it needs to be from the grassroots up in order for us to make changes. That's the things that we've learned, you know, for many, many years. Um, she passed this week. She was 90 years old and had only had one toe amputated. She lived with diabetes for all that time because of the education, and she says it all the time, because of the education that we gave her. Because of this research, which was looked at by Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, making sure that we looked at it medically, how we were going to do research, what we needed to gather, and how would it affect the community. So we actually gave something back to the community that made them healthier. We touched 900 people during that research. And I can tell you that today I see a lot of people that live with diabetes that still today tell me, thank you for that education, thank you for doing that for us. And from that research, we actually went on also to see that the, the people that are diabetics have depression. And we did a research on depression. And now we're doing a research from that depression on the stress factors of depression. So research really can be something that, and this for me, when uh, Mike brought the iMobile and the Lions Club and everything, it's a form of research, right? Because you're bringing people, you're doing something for free, but you're not just dropping it as a screening, you're, you're really following up, and you're really seeing that people's lives are affected and changed by that. So, um, the one thing that I can say to all of you, that's probably the most important thing that I can say to you, remember that we always have to listen, watch, and learn to our community, so that when we put things together, whether you're sitting in the community development director's position, or the senior center, or the custodian that I have at the senior center, or a nurse that comes in, anybody listen, because they know what the community needs. They see things that we don't see. And if we all just put ourselves in our bubble of our own life, and we don't listen and hear, we don't make changes. So that's my 
spirit of it. Thank you for your time. And I am really proud that as I watched and listened to all of you speak, Boston Food Bank, we have Boston Food Bank. I've been doing it for 28 years. I love my job. But it's a really good thing that we can really say that we are. And as I sat there and, and listened to Dr. Uh, Co speak, or Dr. Cole speak, I said to Sue, Wasu, like we are doing a phenomenal job. Every single point that he touched about, we've been working on for many, many years in this city. So we're blessed to have this community. I thank you all for participating. I thank you all for wanting to learn and really listen. And I thank you for what you do. I thank you for what you do. And I thank you for what you do. Thank you. Martha, I'd like to invite all of our panelists up and, and take a seat at the front of the room just for a 10 minute um, question and answer session. Uh, you guys have all had very informative, very touchy, stimulating presentations, and I'm sure the audience has um, further discussion that they'd like to, to engage with. Yes, please. I have a question. Excuse me, I have a question for the first two speakers. It was a wonderful presentation. I mean, the whole notion of community participation is absolutely crucial. I work on child suicide in the Arctic, which is the highest child suicide rate in the world. Uh, there, the tribal council, the equivalent of the mayor's office here, the tribal council insists that all research goes through them for community participation, as you call it. But the tribal councils are in almost all the cases up there, very much a part of the problem. They would rather, for example, spend money on fixing up their tribal offices than no place, none of the places have a safe house for children, for youth. For How do you get community participation where the equivalent of the mayor's office is very much a part of the problem that you face and where they insist that all research goes through them. Wow. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it haunts me. I wake up in the middle of the night worrying about this. I think that from my perspective. So I've had, I started my career in the nonprofit world, then um, as part of uh, running the Mayor's Hill Task Force. I sat at the Office of Community Development as a coordinator for eight years, so I was able to bridge both sort of worlds. And I, I'm going to get to the point where, where this is going. And then now I sit in completely government. It's taken us eight years to get people within government to understand how health really is in all policies. How do what you do impacts people's lives and, and their well-being in our community? And so we could have given up a long time ago. But it has to be, remember that trust building piece that I was saying? It's about momentum, it's about education, it's about finding, being a visionary, and finding ways where you can connect the dots, partner. I have, I mean, at the beginning of my career, I was at everything. When I'm telling you I was at the, um, anything, I mean, there is a, this awards that I've been doing, you wanna be part of that board? Yeah. Uh, there is a nice party. Oh, yeah, I'm going. Do you want to do this? You want to do that? And to the point that people start to recognize that this is just personally, because sometimes this is how it starts for some people. And then when the task force began to make way and really establish itself as a leader in public health, and one major point where that was really great was in 2010 when the actual Department of Public Health said to us, you know what? You're doing everything that a, a sort of like community health uh, network area is doing. The, you know, the Department of Public Health breaks up the state into 27 different areas. Might as well you assume that role and be that that you know that organization for Lawrence, beyond Lawrence to Greater Lawrence. And you start building this relationship and this reputation and this partnerships with people like Harbor and Dana Harbor, and it evolves into this this okay wait wait a minute um, this this group is making noise. Well, this group really is well represented. It's a journey. It's very difficult. And still to this day, not everybody understands how public health, it's in community development, in planning, in economic development, in the health department, in everywhere. And so it is a process. And it has taken us, capacity building has been another way that we have tackled this. 
we have educated not only the community and providers, but also government. There are many times where I go before city council, I've gone before city council to explain how does this that we're trying to pass, this you're trying to block, impacts the health. Just last week, I was asked to go and talk about the Housing Affordability Act. There is a, 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 a development that's coming into the city, and they're pushing back for certain reasons. And I stood there, and that was my only role. Let me explain to you what affordable housing really means and how it impacts. It took me 20 minutes. And by the time I was over, it's like, oh my God, I can totally see the connection between public health and housing and community development and economic development and how it impacts the homeless and the whole thing and with HIV and this and that. There was the aha moment. It's a journey. You cannot keep up. And you need to find allies in your work. And it could be one person within that, that tribe that you train, they take out of your wing, that it's a process. I know that it's it's not the ideal uh, response because to this day, we're the only Chennai, which is Community Health Network area, that is positioned within city government in the entire Massachusetts. We're a model. How did that happen? It wasn't an, a, a, it wasn't an accident. It took a lot of work and will continue to take a lot of work. Now in my position as community development, then that's another thing that I'm going to try to do, bring community back into that community development. Bring that sort of lens of social justice and, and health equity into the work that we do. How do we outreach? How do we choose programs that are federally funded? How do we choose housing developments that make sense for our community? Not only because of the way they sit, but who lives there and how we're going to build that, that sort of neighborhood based on these plans. That's what's really neat. You have to be passionate and you have to have a plan and a vision to build allies, be consistent, and really build momentum in everything that comes up. Never give up. No. <laughs> Um, so my question is a little bit of question, a little bit of suggestion, but I was just wondering if the programs have that engaging community health workers to help do some of this outreach. Um, I'm thinking especially with the food program, um, you saying that sometimes the program has food like This seems like a very symbiotic match of community health workers um, into some of these projects. I'm thinking in for an assistant of some sort and I'm thinking in all ways of community health work a little bit around yourself. What I thought there's one. Um are you gonna I put a community health worker in your bed? Uh because we do write grant. I mean that I still need if we want to go ahead with a program like this that I need to uh, see uh, if there's uh, interest in how much they on the part of government in particular around uh, here. And uh, uh, yeah, we certainly want to involve the community as best as possible. Uh, there's no reason not to. Uh, and that's been our practice all along over the years and when we provide service to uh, Lawrence, to have uh, Lawrence residents and community activists so as far as I'm concerned, um, I think that the most important thing that we all understand, um, anybody in administration, is that programs do cost money. I get that. It's time consuming. And in the community that we live, um, it's not one unit of service. It's 18 unit of service. I mean, this past year, and for the people that don't know the Lawrence Senior Center, it's not about seniors, it's about community. It's about community. It's not about seniors. I serve seniors. That's my job. I'm supposed to listen, um, know what their needs and wants are. But if I fix a senior and I don't fix a family, I don't fix a community. So I need to fix a community. So in this past year, we've done over 128 units, 128,000 units of service in our building. And that's not counting everything that we do with partners and people that are coming in and using the building and so on and so forth. So when you're looking at doing community health workers, you have to understand that it's it's written that, okay, this person's gonna work 30, 30 hours and they're gonna do this, 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 and that. Well, you know, they could work 30 hours or they could work 45 hours or they could do just five families once a week because they have a huge need. I believe that everything that we do does need follow-up, so I am the one that sits at the table and say, are we putting something attached to this that has somebody that's going to follow through and make sure? Because we can screen people for free, but then what happens? Right? If you don't have somebody to follow up. 
if Greater Lawrence, I know because I, I do a food pantry every month, twice a month, for $1,800 almost every month. And I've been doing it for 10 years, not 1,800. But we started with 100, and today we're up to 18 because of food insecurity. But I know what it takes to do a food pantry. It doesn't take one or two volunteers. It doesn't take one or two staff. It takes a lot. And the thing is, is that if we don't do these kinds of things, we can put all policies and systematic things that we want in place. But if, a, if someone has a food insecurity and they don't feel secure with the person they're speaking, or they feel safe in telling them that they're hungry, they're going to be hungry without any of us making any changes in their lives. So it's a human body that has to make sure that that person gets food, that that person feels comfortable enough to say, I'm hungry, that that person feels comfortable enough to say, I don't have enough money to pay gas and I'm cold. And I go through this with families of seniors, seniors, and young people. We see it. I see everybody at the center, young to old. So it happens. So that's a really good point. And I think that as we all look to do things, we all have to look to see that we have to staff people to do these things. So a question here in the back, and then we'll go to the other side. So, um, Part of what Thelma talked about is the need to educate the academic community about utilizing the, the community, but I'm wondering about, on the academic side, um, helping to inform the community about the IRB process and how to make it work so that it fits federal requirements and things like that, so I'm just curious about so um, one of the hats I wear is um, at Harvard Catalyst, which is our clinical transition science center. And so some of the work that we're actually building up right now is exactly that. Sort of say, you know, we, we're offering training certainly to academics to say, how do you conduct engaged research sort of across a spectrum of engagement? Um, but then on the other hand, what do community partners need to know? What do they have to have in place? Um, and then drawing on some of the work that Bill and my colleagues have done, you know, what can they bring to the table at that first meeting to say, here's how we want you to describe the product in ways that we understand what we're going to get out of it, what the needs are, what the impact, you know, to sort of have this, um, not only capacity building, but like tools and resources so that they can come to the table um, feeling that they know what questions they want to ask and how they want to engage, um, but then also some of the institutional support about how do you set up these IRB systems or, you know, places in which Harvard can serve as a support for some of these communities. You're making the community understand that IRB is a requirement. Right. Yeah. How do you how do we collaboratively work? Sure. I think that part of it is also that the role of the advisory board for any of these research projects is key. Because uh, you need two levels. You need us, the community people, to understand the research process and the importance of the IRB. And many of us have had to be certified in IRB in order to be part of that process. And so there's that education that they bring to us, and there's conversation that happens. And then for the community, now you bring it to another level, uh, you don't need to inform the community of, about the IRB and all that because it's, it's irrelevant. But our role is to make sure that that IRB, those consent forms, all those things, we digest it to a point that we can actually relate it to the community. Relate the need of the, you know, this is why this project is important. Yes, there's a lot of questions, but this is, gonna, this is what, what's the benefit. And then when that project is done and we have dissemination and all this process has happened, we oftentimes figure out ways to do dissemination. And we bring that. We have had parties, you know, sort of celebrations at the senior center to say thank you to the people that participated. This is what, what you contributed, brought back to us. This is how this is going to help inform policy, inform programs. And then, you know what? Word of mouth happens. And then the next project comes around, and people are more sort of keen to, oh, I know what that is. All of us are part of this. And many times it's the same people being, you know, brought back to do a follow-up study. So I think it's a process. I think it's a process from the, from the research world and the academic world to come to us, form those partnerships, build those trusts, educate one another, give them the pulse, they give us what they need, we negotiate and come to an agreement, and as the process and the project goes on, which is usually anywhere between three to five years, we're all at the table meeting quarterly, by monthly to make sure. I mean, we have changed projects' names. I remember Mass Connect for Kids, and it was a project for tobacco uh, and, and, and secondhand smoke and, and the impact of little children. And we worked with early intervention you know, programs. And recruitment was an issue. And until we said, you know what? Mass Connect for Kids sounds like mass health. It sounds like the, the government is there. And we changed the name. I can't remember the name of the study. But we changed the name to a more friendlier, you know, huh? 
Tobacco Free Kids, yes, thank you. So Tobacco Free Kids, oh, I want to be a part of that project. I want my kids to be smoke free. Change completely and the recruitment change. I mean, so those are the things that need to happen. It's not just the RV, but how do we understand the project, disseminate it, and really make full use and form these partnerships that can be to the benefit? Yeah, I can also say that when we do our IRVs, um, we actually get educated, right? Because the researcher comes to us with all oh, this paperwork, right? And we have to do the reading and, and look at it and then make our notes. And then we have that. It's not, it's not like hundreds of hours. We really do have a lot of time, like one on one with them, like saying, this isn't going to work. This is how it needs to be scripted. What is the words that we can change? What are the words that we can't change? How is it going to look? Um, and I think that she's absolutely right. We were in a grant together, Vilma and I, um, and it was going to be called uh, Lawrence Mental Health. <laughs> right? Yes. And we're like, excuse me, what does that mean? Are we mental? Are we, what are you looking at? How are you doing it? And, and we changed it to, you know, Lawrence uh, Wellbeing. Now, it was Lawrence Health and Wellness. You know? <laughs> but we first started with Wellbeing, right? Because we wanted to make sure that we wanted to make sure that it is about Wellbeing. Not about like we are really vocal about taking away the negative words, right? Because if you, if you put a negative on it, it's going to be a negative, and it's going to be written negative. We actually had somebody do research that worked with us, and we worked together. And when she brought the report before it was going to be that work, yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> this isn't going to be published. This is never going to be put like this because everything. The first word, you know, I tell my staff, don't ever use the word no first. That's not the first thing that should come out of your mouth. Thank you all. Robert gets the clock. Please join me in thanking our speakers again one last time.